Ever since the end of the Second World War, the town of Slough has grown rapidly. It's a commuter hotspot for those working in London and it has the largest privately owned trading and industrial estate in Europe. Outside of London, it has the most company head offices and one of the most diverse populations in the country. But while some parts of the town are less than 100 years old, there is a lot of history here, including the magnificent station. Slough is in Great Western Railway territory and the town was well established even before the railways passed through. Turnpikes and the Great Bath Road helped keep the town moving and in its heyday, up to 10 stagecoach services a day were passed through ferrying people about. It was a long and bumpy ride, but it was certainly a lot quicker than walking. In 1835, plans were submitted by the Great Western to build a line between Paddington and Maidenhead, with a station proposed at Slough, but it received a strong pushback from Parliament. They proposed that Slough Station was less than three miles from the best school in the country, Eton. Members of the selected houses were read that their sons and possible future leaders would find the station just too tempting and leave the safety of the college and to be able to board a train and head to the corruptible and questionable London city streets. They ordered no new station unless Eaton's dean and headmaster permitted it and the railway was forced to comply. So the line was built and opened by 1838. But the act had a rather large loophole. True, Slough couldn't have a station, but what's stopping the train from just, well, stopping there? It's not 100% sure how it started. Maybe it was a worker who asked the crew to make an unscheduled stop so he could get to his supper quicker, or a passenger asking to make a special discretion. But more and more people began to join in. The Great Western approached a nearby hotel to ask to them to sell tickets on their behalf, which the hotel was more than happy to do. They couldn't designate it as a station, so nothing was written into the timetable as a scheduled stop. But cleverly, the Great Western decided to add a few extra minutes to the timetable so the trains wouldn't appear late. It didn't take long for the rules stretching to reach the ears of parliamentarians, and I can only imagine they had a few choice words for the Great Western, but faced with no choice and the fact that people were literally putting themselves in danger for the sake of getting on board, they relented and repealed the clauses in the act, paving the way for a station to finally be built. There was only one person that the Great Western Railway would call upon for their new station, Isambard Kingdom Brunel. Since the town was not large at this point, he felt a smaller, straightforward station would suffice. So, like many early smaller stations, the station was built from timber, but within a year, it was upgraded. It was still timber, but it had been made grander and one of the largest stations in the area. It was not for popularity, but Brunel had gotten word that a very special passenger would be travelling from Slough to Bishop's Bridge for the very first time. Queen Victoria. The Queen arrived to Slough Station in 1842 and boarded a specially constructed carriage with a family. Brunel himself was the driver. He needed to ensure this run was perfect. If the Queen approved, then he knew the railway would be the talk of the town. The run went as smooth as silk and the Queen wrote in her diary that she was quite charmed with the experience. The station was, for a time, was designated a royal station thanks to its close proximity to Windsor, so it had to accommodate. The road surrounding the station was widened for the Queen's carriages and for the guards surrounding her, and the place had an air of importance with the Royal Hotel nearby, ready for many visiting dignitaries. But the station was made famous for a very different reason in 1845, and it would not have made the Queen amused at all. Although he was a devout Quaker, John Towell was certainly not a good boy. In a time where judges were less inclined to don the black hanging cap, John found himself being deported to Australia for his crimes of forgery, rather than face the noose, thanks to his religion and a very forgiving victim. John worked among the coal ships as a clerk and his employers petitioned on his behalf to pardon him from his crimes. He settled down with a local girl and had two kids and ran a small pharmacy shop, which he had quite good success. In 1831, John had the funds and the means to travel back to England, but the London air hit the family badly. 
Less than 10 years after they arrived, both of John's sons would be dead and his wife became seriously ill. John employed a nurse called Sarah Hart to take care of her, but his wife passed shortly afterwards. You would have expected that Sarah's services were no longer needed. However, John had taken a liking to the married woman and the two started having an affair, which resulted in two more children being born. The affair was still going by the time John married again to a widow called Mrs. Cutliff, but the love between the two was now waning and John saw Sarah as a burden rather than a blessing, but for the sake of the children, he stuck with her. He moved her and her family to Slough to get her out of the way and paid a pound a month for child support. But the money was draining and the pounds were adding up and Sarah was becoming more and more of a nuisance. So John made the decision. She had to go. On New Year's Day of 1845, John bought two bottles of acid. The acid was freely available and was used to create a tonic for varicose veins. The acid's primary ingredient is prussic acid or hydrogen cyanide. It is extremely toxic and can kill within minutes if ingested. Armed with this poison, he visited Sarah and when she was distracted, he poured it into her beer. The poison took effect instantly and Sarah fell to the ground groaning in pain. Her groans attracted the neighbour who saw Telwell make a run for it. The neighbour's screams caught the attention of a passing vicar who asked the distressed woman what the man looked like. After a brief description, the vicar ran for the station and saw Towel board the 742 departing service. Under most circumstances, John would have gotten away with it and blended into the London masses, but Slough had a little trick up its sleeve. It had telegraph. The vicar spoke to the station master who arranged for a message to be sent to Paddington which read, a murder has just been committed at Salt Hill and the suspected murderer was seen to take a first-class ticket to London that left Sow at 7.42pm. He is in the garb of a Quaker with a brown great coat of which reaches his feet. He is the last compartment of the second first-class carriage. The message was read loud and clear and a little surprise awaited Mr. Telwell. The duty sergeant disguised himself using a plain coat and lay in wait for the steam train to arrive. The train arrived right on time and right as the message described, out came Mr. Talwell. The duty sergeant followed him to an omnibus. The disguise worked too well as the sergeant sat on the conductor's seat and John paid him the fare as he alighted onto Princess Street. But the sergeant slipped off the omnibus as well and followed him around the town as he frequented several shops and cafes until John, tired from the day, went to his lodgings for the night. The sergeant retired to Paddington to plan his next move. The next morning, armed with an inspector, the pair found Talwell at a local cafe. They moved in and caught John completely by surprise. John protested his innocence. It wasn't in Slough, he protested. The sergeant was only too obliging to correct him, even referencing the sixpence he gave him. John's religious influences would not save him this time, and despite a frankly weird and failed defence blaming an excess consumption of apple pips for Sarah's death, it was sent to the gallows for a second time. This time, though, the gallows would claim him. The arrest, though, was only made possible by the invention and implementation of the telegraph. It was heralded as a breakthrough in technology. It took a few years for the dust to settle, but Slough lost its royal status in 1849 when a station was built closer to Windsor for the Queen's convenience, much to the annoyance that the deans are eaten. But the station enjoyed a steady and increasing stream of passengers. In 1884, the old station had long gone and it had been rebuilt four times over. So a new impressive brick station was built in fact, it's the station building that can be seen today. Around the same time of the new station opening, it gained a new and unexpected resident. A little sickly puppy appeared on the platform begging for help. The staff took pity on the little dog and nursed him back to health, but the dog refused to leave the station. The dog was street smart. He stuck to the platforms and was able to move around the crowd easily. The worker strapped a small collection tin to his back and the little pup wandered around the people collecting donations for the Great Western Charity Funds for Widows and Orphans. The workers called the little dog Station Jim and they would feed him scraps from their lunches 
and give him a warm night by the station master's fire. Unfortunately, Jim's health conditions came back to haunt him and he was forced to retire after a few short years, but his friendly nature earned him thousands for charity. Jim remained on the station and the staff gave him all the pet comforts he needed, but sadly he died in 1896, still wearing his harness. The local community mourned his loss and raised money for him to be taxidermied and placed in a glass case with a collecting tent nearby so Jim could still collect and do the job he loved. He's still there today, overwatching his favourite place from Platform 5. Four years after Jim's death on the 16th of June, the 1305 local drain sitting at Paddington was late. The summer sun and the festivities at a local race course caused a swell of passengers. Extra coaches were added to help with the crowd control, but the shunting took time and the train left Paddington nearly half an hour late. It managed to make up some time when it pulled into Slough and it had to be held there while tickets were collected, but the train was safe. The signallers had ensured it by switching both the home and the distance signal to danger. The idea is that the distance signal box would accept the train but warn the driver as the train stopped at the signal. Once that was done, the train would be allowed to proceed to the home danger signal and await its turn in and around the station. It did not appear to be a good day for the Great Western as the express from Paddington to Falmouth was also late and was racing to make up its own lost time. It was not scheduled to stop at Slough, so there was a chance it would arrive on time and they were doing well at an average 60 miles an hour. It raced past the distance signal without a care in the world, much to the shock of the signalman. He raced to the phone to ring the home signal box, but the call was missed. But the Slowey signaller had other problems. He heard the train, much quicker than anticipated, and was frantically waving his flag and shouting to the passengers to get back. The local train stood no chance. The express ploughed into the back of the carriages. The fireman had seen the home signal and tried to apply the brakes but it was too little too late. The rear carriages were totally destroyed and five people were killed, scores were injured. The toll would have been much higher had it not been for the signaller's actions to try to clear the platform. The blame was laid solely on the crew of the express. The driver was nearly 60 and his years on the line were catching up with him, plus he'd been working non-stop since 5 a.m. The fireman was younger and was equally punished, but he was given credit for trying to stop the train. The guard also received the same treatment, as he too was busy tending to the luggage parcels rather than checking signals. The Great Western were also criticised for having inadequate braking. The railway took the criticism to heart and its very next engine of the production line had vacuum brakes on all of its wheels, including the tender, rather than relying just on the steam brakes. From the turn of the century and following the two world wars, Slough exploded in population. Two new large estates were built to accommodate the scores of Londoners moving away from the city in the wake of the Blitz, and the city turned to private industries. The station underwent changes too. Platforms were expanded and modified to allow for electrification, but there are still elements of its classic style, especially in the traditional canopies and the station roofs, and the ornate metalwork of the pillars. It's a great station, and a brilliant gateway to London, and especially Windsor.